folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast, part four of Incantations. We're getting into the good part now. We're getting in today, we're going to finish this series out. We're getting into something today that the Lord showed me out of the book of Exodus concerning incantations and something about what Moses did and what Pharaoh's magicians did. You're going to see something here, all right? We left off last week. Remember, we're dealing with Manasseh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33. He's trying to build the new world order. He's doing all these things, and we're at the part of what he does as far as enchantments is concerned. He uses incantations. What are incantations? This is from last week. Summoning spirits and commanding them by rituals, repetition, magic words, certain tones, such as the ohm, and we left off last week talking about the, the ohm sound, when, um, when those who practice yoga, they get together and they put themselves in what's called the lotus position. Why is it called that? Because in Eastern mysticism, the lotus flower has uh, something hidden on the inside of it, and when the lotus flower blooms and opens up, then whatever, they say Brahma is in there. Brahma is a Hindu deity. He's a god, and he's trapped. He, Get me out of this flower. Okay, we're going to do a meditation. We're going to perform an incantation so the flower will open, and the flower opens, and now Brahma is revealed. Guess who that is? That's the beast. That's, this is the pit here, okay? Here's the, the womb of the earth, the woman, and it's going to open up. Floodwaters are going to issue forth, and that which is hidden in there. Then shall that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, what 2 Thessalonians says. So when someone gets in, in yoga, to the lotus position, think about it. They're about to let out something that is on the inside of them. They say it's a, the word yoga means connect. Just like all these churches having connect groups. We want to connect. The idea of yoga is that you connect to the gods. Not a good thing, I'm telling you, don't, don't do yoga, don't have yoga practices in your church. If you do, I would get out of there because they're letting out spirits. We're going to be dealing with familiar spirits after this one. That's contemplative prayer and yoga because they get in contact with these devils. So the person gets in the lotus position, they're the flower, they're going to open up with the incantation and the God that is on the inside of them is going to arise out of that. That, and they, they use the mantra, the incantation of Om. And remember, to the, to the Hindus, to the mystics, it's not a word. It's a sound. It's a sound that has no meaning to it. Well, that sounds like the lost word to me. Here's our illustration of it, the Om symbolism. Remember, it represents the heavenly region and the wakeful state or the earth region, deep sleep and being awake at the same time. Remember these, uh, some of these priests, some of these uh, Buddhist priests and these monks, they have the ability to make overtones with their throat. They can make two tones, and it sounds like it's simultaneously, but it's not. It's just very, very rapid switching between two tones. And those two tones represent there's one high and then there's one low. You get it, right? Okay, the two join together coming out of, this, out of the same throat. Jesus said their throat was an open sepulcher. Um, Solomon wrote in the Proverbs that the, the throat or the mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. Think about the pit that the beast is in. and We're going to open our throat, we're going to hum the mantra, the lost word, and he's going to come out of it. That's what an incantation does. When you utter an incantation, you say the sacred words, the sacred name, or whatever it is, you're going to invoke the presence of a god. Watch this one. Here's a quote from Morals and Dogma. Albert, Fat Albert Pike, all right? Here's what he, because he talked several times about the Ohm. And what he says in here is that the Ohm is related to Hiram, whom he says is like a variation of the word Ohm. The Hindu word Ohm represented the three powers combined in their deity. Think like lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Think of Genesis chapter 3. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva or the creating, the preserving, and the destroying powers. There's your clue, Sherlock. He's the destroyer. Um, A, the first, U, or O, the second, and M, the third. This word could not be pronounced except by the letters. So watch this now. Here we go. 
for its pronunciation as one word was said to make earth tremble and even the angels of heaven to quake for fear. I have that underlined for a reason. The word Aum, says the Ramayan, represents the being of beings, one substance in three forms, without mode, without quality, without passion, immense, incomprehensible, infinite, indivisible, immutable, incorporeal, irresistible, ignoramusable. Because that's who he is. That's who Shiva is. He's the destroyer. He's the beast. He's the antichrist. He is the opposite of Jesus Christ. There's a word. There's a word that is a name for Jesus that sounds very similar to Om. Okay? You can get ahead of me if you want. But look at what Pike said. He said, when this, and remember, when the, when the monks make the Om, and they do that overtone, what they're doing is they're sending out waves. They are sending out vibrations. They are sending out frequencies. If they have the ability to make the overtones, they can send out two frequencies at once. What is a frequency? How, do earthquake, how are earthquakes measured? When they have the little pin drawing on the little slow moving wheel and an earthquake starts, it comes in waves, doesn't it? It's not just one move and then, okay, we're done. It happens in waves, frequencies, quaking, shaking. That's what happens with your voice box. That's what happens with sound. It vibrates off of things and it quakes it and it shakes it. He's saying that the pronunciation of Om under the right circumstances will shake the world and heaven. Dun, dun, dun. Look at what the Bible says. Hebrews 12, 26. Whose voice, think about it, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Stop right here. God's going to shake the earth, and there are those who will not be able to stand, they're going to fall. God's going to shake the heaven, like, like I don't know if you've seen uh, apple orchards, the big orchards, uh, or different fruit orchards. The guy goes around on a tractor, and he's got a he's got a implement on the front of his tractor, and it reaches out and grabs the bottom of the tree, and it goes and it shakes all the fruit down off of it. And you just go, okay, that's pretty cool, okay, because that's like the easy way. How do you get fruit out of the tree? You either pull it or you shake it. God is going to shake the heavens. Some things are going to fall out. What are they? Revelation 6. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is, what? Shaken of a mighty wind. So I want you to put this together. We believe the scriptures. We know for a fact this is going to happen. Those who are going to practice this, and let me tell you where I'm going. I think there's going to come a time when the mouth of the world, everybody in the world, is going to do the same incantation. Sounds a little strange, but just think about it. The voice of the world, the mouth of the world. See, the New Agers, the New Agers every year, they want people to gather together and say, let's think positive things and let's visualize world peace, and let's speak world peace. It's all about everybody visualizing it all at once. It's about the collective thought of mankind making things happen, because that's what they believe. So I think that there's going to come a day when the entire earth of, of people, minus born-again believers, are going to chant or incantate some sort of chant or incantation is going to come out of the collective mouth of all of humanity. That's who the strange woman is. It's all the wicked people in the earth. And because of that, this beast is going to rise up. and These angels are going to fall. Maybe I'm off on that. But that's where I think the incantations are going. Especially when we get back to Exodus and you see what's there. The, the priests and the magicians and the wizards of Pharaoh 
were able to do something with their incantations. And there it means something, all right? So we know there's going to come a time when the things of the earth are going to fall and the angels are going to fall just like figs out of a tree when they're shaken. And Pike mentioned that this alm sound shakes the earth and it shakes the heavens as well. So I think there is a connection. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15, you're going to like this, because remember what falls out of heaven. Revelation, in Revelation chapter 12, we have the dragon falling out of heaven and a third of his angels falling out of heaven. There is something, I think, that happens on the earth that brings that about. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15, I never saw this. Somebody sent this to me. Pastor, what do you think of these two verses together? And I went, that's pretty good. Okay, and if you're the one, you get a free video from Prophetic Research Ministry. You can get it off YouTube. Anyway, I said, watch this now. The, the dragon's going to fall. His angels are going to fall. The dragon on his way down is going to take his tail and bring the angels down with him. Watch this. Isaiah 9, 15. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. Now look at Revelation 12. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail, think of who the tail is. The tail is the prophet that teacheth lies. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her children as soon as it, or devour her child as soon as it was born. The tail of the dragon are all the false teachers and false preachers and false prophets everywhere. Doesn't matter if they're Hindu or Muslim or Roman Catholic or Southern Baptist or Charismatic. It doesn't matter who they are. Every false prophet, false teacher, false preacher, false teacher, false book, false Bible, secret societies, all that, that is part of Mystery Babylon, they're going to speak their lies that's the tail of the dragon. And that tail is what brings those angels down. Now remember, what, are the, what is the purpose of incantations? It's to summon devils. It's to summon demons. It's to bring spirits either up from the ground or down from the earth. The, um, the woman who had a familiar spirit who lived in Endor that Saul went to see, she summoned gods up from the earth, from the ground, with incantation. She had a familiar spirit. We're going to be dealing with that. That's the next series coming. And be ready, okay? But anyway, they chant. They, in, they give their incantations. They say their sacred names, their power Hebrew letter words, uh, whatever it is in magic, they do it. They do it in, um, in church services. Say these words, and you're going to bring the power of God in you. Uh, what, people sent me an email yesterday saying uh, their pastor is teaching that, they, that there are certain people in the church that are part of the inner circle. They're the ones who are going to get all the blessings from God. Those who only come part of the time, they get nothing. It's a setup, people. It's a setup, I'm telling you. Okay. So anyway, but this idea, this om is chanting. It's, it's a, a meditation. It's an incantation. And all these false prophets doing their magic, doing their, saying their spells, casting their spells, whatever. They can call it Christian or prayer all they want to, but that's what it is. Their idea is to invoke the presence of a deity, a devil, a god, fallen angel, a locust out of the pit of the earth, even the man of sin himself, the son of perdition. I think that's the purpose of it. The tale of the dragon are the false prophets and the false teachers of this world. Now, those who practice all of these religions, yoga, things like that, they use om, enchanting, meditation. Um, I even read that in the sacred Hindu texts, that om symbol would be a mark on those texts. Think about it. Um, and it's sort of like when you see this symbol, this is, this is the God speaking, or this will invoke the God, or whatever it is. But it represents the all, it represents enlightenment, and so on. Now we know the man of sin is the opposite of the son of righteousness. We know that great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. 
We know then that the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and I think that is the beast or Satan manifested in the flesh of humanity. It's just the opposite of, of what God does. So, Om is their incantation word, has no meaning. I think the opposite of that is a word that we use quite often. Amen. Now see, Amen has meaning to it. Om does not. It's the opposite. Om is an uncertain sound. Amen is certain. When you hear somebody say amen, what does that mean? They agree to it. By the way, amen is one of the names of Jesus Christ. Look at it. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Jeremiah, Je, let, let me stop here. Amen, we, we, I was always taught that amen means, you know, so, so be it, or we agree, or let it be established, or right on, okay? That's what it means. Look at the text of the Bible. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness. So whatever God says, Jesus is the amen to that. He is the faithful witness. He is saying, I agree with my Father. He and I are one. When the preacher preaches from the Word of God and the people say amen, they are establishing a second witness to what the preacher says. So if the preacher says something dumb and stupid, like sometimes I do, and nobody says amen, then people are going, okay, well, maybe that didn't go over so well. Okay? You understand, though, so the Bible's defining for you what the amen is. By the way, let me clear this up. There's stuff on the internet about just about every, everybody that hates God and the Bible and Jesus Christ is going to put stuff on the internet. There's this stupid idea of going around that the word amen actually comes from uh, Amun-Ra or the Om, and when you say amen, actually you're invoking um, a pagan god or the sun god or whatever. You're not saying that amen is a, is a vile, contemptible, filthy word should never be uttered by born-again Christians. That's not true. That's not true, because if that was true, then that would mean that this book is wrong, and this book is not wrong. You don't, you don't know that the word amen came from the Egyptian Amun-Ra or the Om sound. You don't know that. Some guy made that up, put it on the internet, but you don't know that for a fact. What you should know is, my Bible's right, and if Jesus refers to himself as the amen, the second witness, then that's exactly what I believe, and I'll say amen till the day I die. Somebody say amen. Jeremiah 28, 6. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. Stop. You see it? The Bible actually defined for you what the word amen is. Number one, we see it as a, the faithful and true witness to what God said. And number two, Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. What, he, what is he saying? Amen, amen. Amen. Let God do this. Let it be established. Let it be so. We agree. Okay? So I love the Bible. It'll explain everything. So the Lord performed thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessel of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Do you believe that God's going to bring his people back one of these days? Somebody say, Amen. And do so and let the Lord perform the words which he's prophesied. That's what Amen means. See, I love it. And see, now it's the opposite. Jesus is the amen. He is the faithful witness. The Antichrist is the om. Jesus is the word that has meaning. The Antichrist is the word that has an uncertain sound and has no meaning to it whatsoever. See the opposites? Okay. All I have to do when I read the Bible is say amen. And that means I agree with it. And God will bless and God will work his word in me. I like that. Om is, how can I put it? God, on, on, on the Christian side, the believer side, God performs his work, God says his word, and we simply agree to it. On the other side, the devils and the beast 
cannot do anything until the Aum is said. You follow that? It's the opposite, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 14, 7. Even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, that's what om is, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. For there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. You catching that? 1 Corinthians 14 is about tongues. And if an unknown tongue is spoken, it should be by two or at the most three, and then let one interpret. That's God's law. It's clearly God's law. God says there cannot be an uncertain sound unless it's interpreted, because if there is, who's going to know what it says? And there are people who justify speaking an unknown tongue that they themselves never know the meaning of. So the question is, how in the world do you know that you're not summoning devils? You're not actually speaking incantations. You're not actually whistling like a dog whistle and all these dolls, all these devils are going to come up to you. How do you know that? You don't because you're pronouncing an uncertain sound. It's just like the trumpet. When even, even in today's military, there are trumpets used. There are sounds used. They're used on ships. They're used in the battlefield. Now they're electronic. Now they have electronic signatures. But the idea is the same. A, a trumpet sounds one thing. That means attack. Trumpet sounds another thing, that means retreat, retreat. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, what's the army going to do? They have no idea what to do. There's chaos, there's confusion. Okay? You, you just kind of put that in your mind and you ponder that for a while. Next time you're going to let things come out of your mouth that you have no idea what they're saying. How do you know you're just not invoking some evil, evil beast spirit? All right? Now watch this. They made sounds in the plain of Dura with what the Bible described as all kinds of music. Look at what it says, Daniel chapter 3, verse 4. Then in herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Let's put two things into play here. Number one, the meaning of the word om. Albert Pike said the om is, a, is this sound that goes out that makes men fall. Okay, that that's, looks like what we're looking at here. Number two, notice your Bible says cornet, which is a trumpet, a flute, a harp, ring, ring. A uh, sack butt, maybe that's some kind of, like a sack, like a, I don't know, the, uh, what is it the Scotch people wear, okay? The bagpipes, there we go. Psaltery, dulcimer is a hammered string instrument. All kinds of music. You know, if you go to the symphony or the opera, probably don't, but you know what I'm saying. The, the symphony gathers together, and before the concert starts, they do something. What do they do? They'll start playing their instruments. What do they do? They're warming them up. Those who play clarinet and oboe and maybe saxophone, they have to get the reeds good and soaked and wet so they'll vibrate right. Uh, they got to tune with one another. Violinists are, are warming their fingers up, doing runs, and flutes are doing the same thing, and guys tapping the timpani, and he's tuning the timpani. Boom, 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 okay? They're doing all of that, and they're doing all that at the same time. No one ever says, that was the best song I ever heard in my life. No one does that, all right? They wait until all the instruments are playing all the right notes in concert together. When I look here, I don't see all of these instruments as being together, especially when it says all kinds of music. Because all kinds of music would mean one guy's playing one thing, one guy's doing another, one guy's... And go back to 1 Corinthians 14. 
Because that's what he's talking about, whether it's prophesying or tongues. Everybody's got a prophecy. Everybody's got a tongue. But nobody's got an interpretation. They're all doing whatever it is they feel like doing. And Paul says it's out of order. It's not right. It's not God. That's chaos. That's what I see this music as. Chaotic. And remember what the abyss is, the pit. It's chaos. It has no order to it. So they just start blasting all different kinds of music. And what happened to everybody? They fell. Okay? So I think that is similar or related to the ohm sound. All right? So think about this. And I mentioned this just a while ago. The enchantments or incantations, whether it's sacred words or a string of holy words, this is the invocation of God, oh God, we beseech thee. And you read this little prayer and you think God has to show up because you said these words. It's not true. Summoning powers, summoning these devils, these beasts. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Can man summon beasts in this world? Oh, sure. Just ask the boys of Duck Dynasty. They made their fortune making, um, what's his name? Will Roberts, Roberts, Robinson, I don't remember all their names. But he designed a duck call, and it actually worked. And he started making them, started selling them. His son took over, turned it into a, from a mom and pop shop into a multi, probably a multi-billion dollar industry. I don't know, these people are loaded with money. With the TV show and all the products that they sell all over the world, okay? But ask them if their duck call works. And it does. And what does a duck call, a duck call doesn't go, Hey, ducks! doesn't do that. It sounds like a duck. What's the duck call for? It's to call the ducks. It's to invoke the ducks into your presence. Because God designed them that way. All right? Turkey calls. My dad had a box call. When he died, I inherited it. And it's, it's really neat. I like it. I keep it. You take that box call and you go, scrape, 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 scrape. And it sounds like a turkey. And my dad only turkey hunted a couple of years, but he used that box call and he brought them Tom turkeys right to him. Okay? It's an amazing thing. You see, if you don't do it right, listen to this now. You got to do it right. You got to make, and, and dad had it, when he bought the box call, it came with a little 45 RPM record. And he played the record and he, there was this guy on there telling how to use the turkey call to call up if you wanted a tom or you wanted a hen uh, or whatever, what season it was, whether it's spring or fall or whatever, there's certain calls. And if you don't make the call right, turkey's pretty smart. They got a brain that big, but they're pretty smart when it comes to surviving in the woods. And they're no dummy. So if you don't make that call right, they won't come. Are you catching this? Because that's what you're hearing in church. If you don't say the words right, and if you don't say them in the right way with the right tone, in the right rhythm, and if you don't have the, the force faith behind it, God cannot be released to do your bidding for you. Pig calls. People even call pigs. Um, I knew a guy, an old farmer, a church I pastored. Um, he said he, he lived on a farm. He had cattle. And he said, Mike, watch this. Bring your girls out. The girls were little then. So he goes out, and the girl's standing there, and he goes, suck, 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 something like that. And them cows come in. Every cow he had come in right there, and the girls were just going. So they were trying it, and it didn't work. It wasn't his voice. They knew his voice. Think about it. They knew his voice, and they responded to his call. Uh, dog whistles, things like that. There, there are things that man does that can, there's even predator calls. There's these electronic boxes you take out in the woods that'll sound like coyotes. Coyotes are a bad thing in a lot of areas. They kill a lot of farm animals. They kill a lot of uh, wildlife and game that we want to hunt. And so it's legal at certain times in the state of Missouri to go out and, and hunt for coyotes. Because all they are is killers and scavengers. So they use a, a coyote call and it hopefully brings in other coyotes. All right. I know a pastor uses uh, different things. I uses 
dogs barking on a cassette tape in the truck. That's what he used to do, and it calls in those coyotes, all right? So you get the idea. This is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the ability to summon beasts by certain words, and they have to be said right. Because if you don't say it right, the devil won't come. The God won't show up. God won't be released to do what you want him to do. You see how it works now? Okay. John chapter 10, verse 2. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And see, we know, if, you, if you turkey hunt or deer hunt, there, there are deer calls. Some guys like to use uh, deer horns rattling because that means two bucks are fighting. Let's go, let's go see what's going on, all right? Um, or or certain, certain doe calls or turkey calls or duck calls or whatever it is. We know that if you don't make the call right, those deer, they know what a deer sounds like. They're not fooled. Those turkey, they know what a turkey sounds like. And if it's out of cadence, if it's out of rhythm, or it's the wrong call at the wrong time of the year, they're going, I don't know what that is, but that's not another turkey. Let's go, Martha. And they leave. Same thing here. We're the sheep. We know his voice. I know my God's voice. It says, thou and thee and thine and saith. When I'm listening to a radio program and it's Christian or religious in nature and they start quoting scripture, I know whether or not that's the word of God or not. I know whether or not it's King James. If they didn't say thou or thee or thine or saith or whatever, I'm just going, that's not King James. I'm not going to listen to that and I don't. I don't care what they got to say. If they're, if they're not going to say the master's voice, I'm not going to follow it because I know what his voice sounds like. I'm one of his sheep, all right? Well, you, you ponder that, you think about that, because that is that is exactly dead on when it comes to summoning beasts. I was in a gas station one morning, and uh, one of our local deputies had his car pulled out front, and um, he was inside, and it was a canine patrol unit, and he had his German Shepherd dog out in the, out in the squad car. And I walked by, and boy, that dog went to barking at me. So, and the whole time I was in there, the dog was just barking, like crazy. And that cop finally got tired of that and he opened the door to the gas station. His car was right there and he yelled out something and I have going, what in the world did he say? Well, come to find out, he was yelling and barking a German command at the dog and he told me that. And I said, why German? And he said, that's how the dog was trained. The dog was trained in German. And I said, really, why? He said, so that some some crook somewhere, we're trying to chase some guy down. Somebody in English cannot command my dog. Only I can, because I know the words in German to speak to him. And I'm going, okay, that's pretty cool. Look at this one here. Psalm 73, 22, so foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Here is a, a list of German dog commands. Sits, plots, bleib, bring. Come, fuv. I don't. I don't know how to speak German. I got a friend who he'll go, uh, Hoggard, Leave the German to the Germans. Okay, but all of these you can teach a dog certain words, and they'll respond to it. Are you catching this? So God, here's what I found. God uses animal calls to bring forth. Joel's army. Remember what Joel's army is. It's the northern army. It is the army that has the teeth of lions and they sound like chariots and they appear as horses and they are locusts. That's Joel's army, Revelation chapter 9. Look at how God does it. Isaiah 5 verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, 
They shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loose, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hoofs, that's Joel's army, shall be counted like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind, that's angels. And their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. They shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold darkness and sorrow and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Did you see that? Here he's describing the summoning of Joel's army. How does God get them to, to come forth? He hisses at them. Here, look at uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee, think of bees, they have stings, the sting of death, that is in the land of Assyria, and they shall come and shall rest all of them in desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. God is summoning these devils. These are pictures of devils, the fly, uh, Baal supposedly means the Lord of the flies. And not just like flies and maggot flies. I'm talking about like angel flies. With four, flies have four wings, by the way. Okay? You think about that. So do cherubs. Anyway, how does God get them? How does God bring them forth? He makes a sound, a call to them. He hisses for them. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm just telling you that according to the scriptures, two places, this is how God is going to get those armies, those evil angels, to come forth and do his bidding. He's going to hiss for them. Think of, think of someone who owns a German shepherd, a, a policeman, um, someone in the military. And these dogs, man, I, I love reading the stories about these dogs and some of the things they do. It's amazing, all right? And these cops and these soldiers, they are, their hearts are knit with their animals. Okay? And that dog will do whatever that man tells him to do. And if that man, that policeman or whatever says, sick him or go get him, that dog will take off running and he'll tear that person up. Okay? That animal was waiting for the command of the man. Are you catching this? That's what incantations are. Sounds and sacred words that you have to say the right way. You have to use the animal call to get the animal to do what you're supposed to do. And the, and the guy with the German dog gives the German sounds and the guy speaking English or Mexican or whatever, Spanish or whatever, they can't say those words because they don't know them. They can't command the dog because they don't know the sacred names. It sounds like the people who go around telling everybody, I call him Yeshua because that's his real name and I honor him and I think God, Yeshua, hears me because I speak his name in Hebrew. That's a lie. That is an outright lie. Jesus comes to all nations, languages, and tongues. The man who calls him Jesus and calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus hears just as well as the Jewish boy who cries out to Yeshua. It's the same thing. My God's not a beast. He's not waiting for you to say the sacred name in the sacred holy language. He hears everybody cry out unto him in their own language because God knows it. God made it. I don't like that stuff. It's, it's witchcraft. All right, now, something to think about. Animals can only understand simple commands. Let me give an example, okay? Uh, Fido, sit. So Fido sits down, okay? Fido, roll over. Fido rolls over, okay? Uh, Fido, um, lay down. So Fido lays down. Sick him, Fido. Fido goes and gets the stick or the bad guy or whatever, okay? Simple commands. Now, what I'm going to shoot, I'm going to put something up on the screen and ask yourself the question, would I ever talk to a dog this way? Okay, so take a look at it. This is my dog, Fido. I forgot to tell you that Fido's Cajun. He's French. P-H-I-D-E-A-U-X. Okay. Fido, go to the bedroom. Look under the bed. Find six boxes of shoes. Count from left to right the fourth box. Open the box. 
Bring me the left shoe only. On your way back, put three small candy bars from the top of Tommy's closet into the shoe. You will find me in the horse barn to the right in the fourth horse stall. You say that to Fido and Fido goes, I have no idea what you said. You know what that is? That is, number one, witchcraft, and I'll show it to you. Number two, it is the same principle in the charismatic church, word faith, or any of these churches that do the incantations. If you don't speak the right words that, they, that the gods understand, you will not get the gods. Whether it's a sacred name, power words, power thoughts, word faith, positive confessions, it doesn't matter. They're telling you that God's syntax is very limited and he can only understand a few short, simple commands, and they all must be positive. Because if they're negative, then God will only do negative things for you. That's a lie. The God that they're trying to get you to speak to, of course, if you speak great big words and long sentences and, and things like that, their God's going to go. They have no idea what you're saying. So you got you to dumb it down for their God, okay? Let me show this to you. Let me show this to you. This is from a book called Hedge Witchery, written, written by a witch. Look at what she says here. Before we dive deeply into hedge witchery, we have to acknowledge a vital and important secret about the magical universe. Its language base isn't English, Chinese, Russian, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Cherokee, or Swahili, or any of the others as we understand them. Throw grammar and sentence structure out the window. The universe does not acknowledge big words. So guess who the universe is? It's devils. It's beasts. Flowery prose or disclaimers. The source operates primordially, which means at its lowest level. Noun, verb. It does not understand the words no, don't, maybe, possibly, might, not, etc. And the universe is not about creating lack. It is all about attracting abundance of anything. For example, let's say you visit your mother every Thursday night and she always makes chicken. You've politely mentioned that you love her beef stroganoff and maybe next time she might make that. Chicken, however, always takes the day. You've even tried bringing dinner or suggesting you'll make it this time, but somehow or other, mother always makes chicken. Indeed, you've become really focused on how you don't want chicken, and that's the problem. The universe processes only chicken. The universe, does it, universe means the beast, the gods that you're summoning. The universe doesn't understand the contraction don't. It just hears I blah, 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 want chicken, which translates to I want chicken. Except, except you don't, do you? The easiest way to begin using primal language is to say, I want, and then fill in your desire. That's, that could have been written by Creflo Dollar, Frederick Price, Joyce Myers, Kenneth Copeland, Rodney Howard Brown, Mike Murdoch. Could have been spoken by any one of these big name, power word, people. You've got to speak, keep it very simple, speak precisely what you want God to release unto you or it won't be done. If you don't say the right words, God's not released. You won't get it. That's witchcraft, people. She's explaining how to summon devils. Simple words. Fido, fetch. I want in other words, she says, you say, I want, and then fill in your desire. That's the charismatic movement. That's the word faith movement. At its core, that's what it is. Speak those positive confessions and those positive confessions only, and the universe or the fourth face forth, faith force. There, I got it right. Faith force that God has will release unto you those things that you're desiring. Stuff makes me angry. Now watch this. As Christ's voice calls out, remember he's the shepherd, we're the sheep. His words having great power, remember what he did at the tomb of Lazarus. He just spoke, Lazarus come forth, and he that was dead came forth. As Christ's voice has great power 
to bring the dead back to life. The Lord is coming with what? A shout. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. What's going to happen then? The dead in Christ are going to rise. Isn't that neat? That's the voice of the Lord is powerful. The word of God is powerful. Here Jesus is saying, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Man, that's power. So now watch this. Here's the premise now. We're going to get into it. We're going to be, end up in Exodus and something that the magicians did with their incantations, their enchantments. The enchanters of the last days, I think, are going to bring to life their dead God with their incantations and their power words. I think this is why there is an explosion now of word faith, um, the law of attraction. The law of attraction is basically what we read in Hedge Witchery. The law of attraction says if you think it and speak it, then it will come to you. That's, and that's in the witchcraft realm. Those in the word faith movement are practicing the same witchcraft. They're just saying God's going to release it. You have to think the positive thoughts, say the positive words, and when you do that, those things will be attracted to you. God will release, or God will be released to bring those to you. In their world, God is their little dog who responds to their positive commands. That's who God is. They do not have the same God as you and I. It's not the same God. We're not brethren. We're not of the same mind and the same spirit because I don't believe that I can bark commands at my God and get everything I want. I'll show you what I believe. When I get done, I'm going to show you from the Bible how you can speak to God and He hears you. It's very simple. In fact, it's more simple than what these people... See, these, pe these word faith people, every time you start speaking the positive stuff and it doesn't work, you don't get a million dollars in the bank, they'll always tell you, you didn't say it right. You didn't do it right. You didn't have enough faith. You didn't use the faith force in the correct way. You made a negative confession and that canceled out the positive confession. They're always going to tell you that you did something wrong and it's your own fault why you have sickness. It's your own fault why you can't pay your bills and lost your job. It's your own fault why your prayers won't work. It's all on you. God's waiting for you to say the magic words and you won't say it. So you get nothing. I get rich. It makes, it makes, because they're putting, listen, I'm like David, I hate every false way, and that way puts people in bondage that they have to perform and do the dance just right, or God will not listen to them. Here's what I'm saying. John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. He's, right, he's bringing the dead back to life with his voice, his words. Marvel not at this five, in, in verse 28, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. John 11, 43, when he had thus spoken, or, or when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Now I want you to notice in all these verses here, take a look at them, they all deal with the voice of God, the voice of God. Those that are in the graves are going to hear His voice. Jesus, the voice of the Son of God, is going, to, is going to speak, and all of those things are going to come to life. Jesus, with a loud voice, said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Study, study the voice of the Lord. Study the voice in the Bible. Powerful is the voice of the Lord, the Bible says. All right? So now with everything that we're looking at, especially with God, let's turn it upside down. Okay. There is a singing contest in America. Guess what it's called? The Voice. I want you to take a look at their logo. Cue the music. Dun, dun, dun. You get it? Guess who that voice is? Christ's voice always had a like Lazarus come for, Jesus did not stand in front of the tomb of Lazarus and go, oh, he didn't do that. He didn't give an uncertain sound. His voice 
had words to it. It had meaning. Lazarus, come forth. And it wasn't like, Ili Baba, Shana Baba, Baba, Baba. And everybody's going, what did, he, what did he say? I don't know what he said. It was, a, it was like tongues. And then Lazarus going, yeah, what did you say? I mean, I, I woke up, but I had no idea what you said. Everybody around Jesus knew what Lazarus come forth meant. So do we. Their uncertain sound, it's a picture of the Antichrist. He's the voice with no meaning to it. Uncertain sound. And see the, see the logo here, the voice? Okay, that's Baphomet. Represents as above and so below. The powers of the heaven and the powers underneath the earth are going to join together to make the voice. That's what that logo is. Okay? <whistles> That's wacky. Tony Robbins. Anthony Robbins. This big, tall, muscular, handsome guy that is going around giving positive mental images to everybody. He's a motivational speaker. He's going to make us increase our sales by 5,000%. We got Anthony Robbins in here to pump us up. Here's what Anthony Robbins said, one of his seminars, shows you where this guy is. He said, we're going to say a phrase over and over. We're going to shake the building with intensity. Did you catch that? And anchor in our body that feeling of yes, yes, yes. Repeat this phrase after me. Now I am the voice. Now I am the voice. I am a force for good. Now I am the voice. I am the voice. That is from YouTube. You can watch it. It's an Anthony Robbins video called Incantation. I am the voice. Incantation. That's what he said. His book, Unleashing the Power, sounds exactly like what Joyce Myers teaches, that God's power is, is on leash. It's bound up in chains. It's, it's in darkness. It's behind a door, and it's, it's in a cave, and it, it, needs, it wants to come out, but you've got to speak the power words in order to unleash God. It's witchcraft, people, and it's not summoning God. My God is invoked a whole lot easier than with you trying to figure out what exact words to say and with what frame of mind to say it. It's bondage. It's witchcraft. You know what I would do if I were a salesman? Rather than going to a... Because I, I used to sell things with a network marketing company. Actually, a couple different ones. And they used to send us tapes all the time to listen to. And it was tapes about how we can have a better mindset. And um, books. Books would come every month. We'd have to pay for them. Books would come every month. One was called The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, the other one was Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. These people, they're all about thinking the positive thoughts, power of positive thinking, law of attraction. I didn't know it. But those books were full of witchcraft. What they were trying to do was trying to get me to motivate myself to go out and sell, 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 so everybody above me could make money. That's what they were trying to do. People that were pretending to be Christians were sending me books every month. It's called the Book of the Month. Every month I would get a cassette tape and a book on the power of positive thinking, witchcraft. I know it now. I didn't know it then. If I were a salesman and my family's livelihood depended upon me selling things, I think it would be better rather than trying to have some guy convince me that I'm a warlock and that I can speak positive things and make greater sales. I think I would be someone who would go to God and say, God, my family is hurting and we can't pay our bills. God, would you let me sell something this week so I can pay my family's bills? Or just, God, help. I don't know where the money is going to come from, and I, I'll do anything, God. I just, I need help. Can I tell you that in the times when I was concerned about where we were going to pay our bills from, Lisa and I, when we were young and our children were little, no amount of positive thinking kicked me into gear. It was prayer. God, please help me. Please help me raise my family as the man. Please help me to, to earn the money to pay the bills. God, please help me do that. That works better. Trust me. Trust me. It works better. And just, you don't need all that witchcraft stuff. You just don't need it. It's a setup. Okay? Talking about raising things from the dead. You remember Golem? Not from the Lord of the Rings, Gollum. Golem. Golem was this 
the stone image, Jewish, in Jewish Kabbalah, this stone image. In Jewish mysticism, a creature made from stone or clay, brought to life by the power of a Shem, which is the Hebrew word for a name. Sacred Hebrew words, sometimes spoken, sometimes engraved on the forehead of the golem, or by writing them on a paper and inserting them in the mouth of the golem. The word golem is found in one verse in the Bible. I want you to get this. The Jewish Kabbalists were teaching about giving life to an image of stone, just like the false prophet in Revelation. I'm telling you, the setup is everywhere. And trust me, people, trust me. The Hebrew Roots Movement got its origin from the Jewish Kabbalist rabbis who infiltrated and indoctrinated certain men to go and teach these principles, trying to make everybody think it's Torah-keeping, and speaking the, the Hebrew sacred language, but it's all about getting everybody, the false prophet is going to cause everybody to speak these words and give life to the image of a dead statue. Dun, dun, dun. Whew. The word golem, Hebrew word, it is found in the Bible. One place in the Bible. And I'm going to show it to you. It's in Psalm 139, verse 16. You know what that verse is? Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. In Hebrew, that's golem. So here's the golem. He is the unfinished, unperfect, lifeless creature that needs the words spoken to him to come to, come to life. David referred to himself, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Perfect. And in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. What's he talking about? DNA. There's something missing in the lifeless beast that somehow, someway, man is going to contribute. Bring him to life. It's just a, just a little guess, just a little theory. Don't say, Pastor Mike believes this. I'm just floating stuff out there. But obviously... In Jewish mysticism, the idea of a golem is an image made of stone that is brought to life by the sacred words. That's the setup, people. That's where everybody's going. Now, here we go. Watch this. We're going to go back to the book of Exodus, and we're going we're to see what happened with the magicians and their incantations, what they were able to do. In Exodus chapter 7, verse 20, the Bible says, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, verse 22, it says, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. So let's, let's look at this. Moses takes the rod, and we're going to find out what that rod is in a minute. He takes the rod, and he strikes the waters like God told him to, and all the rivers, all the wells, and all the fountains, and everything, all the pitchers of water, everything in Egypt turned to blood. I think literally blood. And people are just going, where's all of our water? When the magicians of Pharaoh go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, don't fall for that. We can do that. Watch. Did you know they did the same thing with what? Incantations. Enchantments. So, so far, their religion is able to do what Moses' religion is. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He was saying, that's nothing. You're just doing magic tricks like my guys do. So that it did not impress Pharaoh. Then we move down the line a little bit. Verse 6 of chapter 8. And Aaron stretched forth his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt, and the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. In verse 17, Then they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in man and in beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. You see, they brought forth the, uh, the frogs. They turned the water to blood. 
They turned their rods into serpents. We ain't got to that yet. We're going to. It's interesting to me that the fourth thing that Moses did was to bring out the lice, and the magicians of Pharaoh couldn't do it. God was not on their side, people. Because I'm telling you, there may be these people on, the, on, on these television shows, these uh, faith healer shows, and these word faith people telling you how rich you're going to get if you're going to send them $10,000. Even if you have to borrow it, God's going to pay it back. Don't worry about it. These people are filling your minds with if you do these things, then, God, then money will come back to you. Now, there's always going to be people who say, it works, it happened with me. And I don't discount that. Just because it worked on a few people does not mean that it's from God. Because Pharaoh's magicians were able to bring forth um, frogs, turn water to blood, turn the rods into serpents. With enchantments, with incantations, with power words, with sacred names, with om with the mystical Hebrew letters. They were able to do that stuff. But when it came time for the lice, they couldn't do it. God was not going to let them do it. So it looks like their religion is like Christianity. But I'm telling you, it won't work the way you were told it's going to work. There is, there is one way, I guarantee you, that you can get a hold of the presence of Almighty God and cause Him to hear you and come and help you. One, there, there's one way. I love it. And it's so simple. I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. But here's what I wanted to get to. Here's what uh, this whole thing, four, four parts now in this one series. And I've had this in my mind the whole time. And I knew where we were going with it because when I first started doing the study of it, God reminded me of this. And it's in His Word. I want you to look at this. Exodus chapter 7, verse 10. This was the first thing that Moses and Aaron did that the magicians were able to mimic with their enchantments, incantations, power words. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. One of my favorite places in the Bible. And the phrase swallowed up, death is, I'll show it to you in a little bit, okay? Why don't you look at it? Aaron takes the rod, casts it down, and it becomes a serpent. Pharaoh looks at that, looks at his magicians. The magicians are going, don't worry about it. We got it. So they start saying power words. They start saying the tetragrammaton. They start saying om and get, casting spells and giving incantations and reading prayers and invoking, invoking spiritual presences. Now, I want you to get this. They were not doing some sort of um, trick play in front of Pharaoh and Moses. They were not secret. They didn't cast the rods down, cover them with some sort of veil while they secretly exchanged them with serpents and then pulled about, oh, look, they're serpents. Didn't say that. They cast their rods down and they spoke magic words to that. And those rod, listen to me now, that dead stick of wood in their hand turned into a living serpent. How did they do it? Incantations. Are you catching it now? This is the summation now of the incantations and the enchantments and what Manasseh did. He spoke the magic words and dead things came to life. It actually, there are witches out there who cast spells. The spells work. They do pretty much what they told the spirits to do for them because they spoke the right words. They know how to do it. They know how to speak dog. They know how to speak wolf. They know how to speak dragon. They know how to do these things. And it works a bunch of times. Not every time, but a bunch of times. And so these magicians, they were not doing some trick play where they manipulated, you know, whatever. They had a serpent, they had a serpent hidden in their, in their jacket pocket and then he pulled it out like that. This, no, they spoke words and a dead piece of wood turned into a serpent. Real witchcraft, real devils doing this. Are you catching this? Okay? Because here's what we're going to look at. We're going to break this down. First, we're going to see the symbolism of the rod. The rod that Moses had, guess what it was? 
Psalm 74, 2, Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast dwelt. Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. It's Jesus. He's the rod. The rod of Moses was Jesus. I like this. That's his authority. That's his power. That's what part of the Red Sea Jeremiah 10, 16, the portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah 51, 19, the portion of Jacob is not like them. He says it again, for he is the former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. The rod of Moses is Jesus. Now, remember, um, in fact, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Here's something, and when I read this, I'm going, okay, if that rod is Jesus, why did he turn into the devil? Because when Moses cast it down, it became a serpent. What's up with that? Think Christ now, okay? Here we go. Numbers 21.8, remember what happened when they spoke out against Moses and against the Lord? God sent serpents among them and bit them and people died. So what did God tell Moses to do? The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. We, we know what that is, don't we? We know it's a foreshadowing of Christ. Look and live. It's the gospel of belief. People say, well, they couldn't be saved back then. They didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Oh, they believed it. They just believed it in the way that God showed it to them, the serpent on the pole. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is saying, remember what Moses did? And everybody looked upon it and lived. I, I'm going to be lifted up that same way. As Moses did it, so I did. And that's the beauty of the Old and the New Testament. In the Old, you have a, you have a shadow of things to come, an incomplete shadow of things to come. In the New Testament, you have the real. In the Old Testament, you have the old Adam who is tempted and sins. In the New Testament, you have the new Adam, Jesus, who is tempted and doesn't sin. See it? It's cool. I like this stuff. Now, you, you still may be struggling. Okay, Jesus being the serpent, I, that's, I don't know about that. It's the same thing I ask God. Okay, God, are you saying that Jesus was the devil? No. But watch this. We know what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Everything about Christ on the cross was a show of his, the defeat of his enemies. Remember Samson? He's got the two pillars, and he said, let me die with the Philistines. And he killed more of his enemies in his death than he did with his life. Here is Jesus on the cross, and he's taken on the form of his enemies, including the biggest one of all, death. Which, who has power over death? Satan, the serpent. What did the serpents do when, they, when God released them upon the Israelites? They killed everybody. Not everybody, but they killed those people they bit. And so you and I are on a course with death because death reigns over us. Christ then took our death nailed it to his cross, so that even when the flesh drops off, you and I live forever. The crown of thorns. Thorns are a representation of sin, the curse of sin. Jesus was wearing it as a crown on his head. He represents death. He represents the sting of death. He represents the power of sin, and he nailed all that to his cross. He was showing his enemies while he was on the cross. Man, I love that. So here's Aaron's rod being a picture of Christ coming down to earth in a low estate, you don't get any lower than a snake, showing his enemies on his, at his death on the cross. And then the magicians did the same thing. So now their rods with their magic spells become serpents. What happened? Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, 
1 Corinthians 15, 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Remember, the serpents represent the devil who has the power of death. And those serpents that had the power of death, and by the way, where is it? The power of death is in their mouth. Just as serpents who bite people and inject their poison and kills them, the false prophets are out there who have those evil words that are just as poisonous and it's killing the souls of mankind. That's what Christ came to save us from. All the fiery darts of the enemy, false doctrines, why we have a shield of faith called the Word of God. Okay? So here's, here's Christ's death in the form of the serpent that Aaron cast down, the rod, the stem of Jesse. And there's all the Pharaoh's serpents, and his serpents were swallowed up in victory. <laughs> You remember when Jonah was cast overboard? You go read Jonah chapter 1, last verse. Jonah was swallowed up by a great fish. Remember what Jesus said? As Jonah was in the whale's belly three days, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Death is swallowed up in victory, people. And I love that. Now let's focus on this, all right? We're getting close here. And Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their wads. So watch this. Aaron casts his rod down, Moses' rod, and he doesn't have to say anything. God makes this thing turn into a serpent. Pharaoh's magicians, they don't have the power of God. They have magic, witchcraft, uh, faith force filled words faith force filled words it's hard to say they have incantations they have tetragrammatons they have they have all the sacred power words to speak and it causes this dead stick to come to life you catching that it's the antichrist he's like a dead stick right now a tree that's dead or whatever and the power words are going to bring him back to life. They're going to revive him, rejuvenate him. He's the dying God that gets to live. Proverbs 14, 3. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. Proverbs 18, 4. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. Proverbs 22, 14, here it is. The mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. Where's the beast coming out of? It's coming out of the pit. The mouth of the strange woman with her incantations and her enchantments and her witchcraft. All right? There is a symbol in, uh, Albert Pike talks about it. Uh, Manley Hall talks about it. There is a god called Hermes. Hermes is, is referred to as, or Mercury, Mercurius. Uh, they called, who was it? They called Peter or Paul, one of the two. They called him Mercurius because he was the preacher. He was the orator. Mercury, or Hermes, is the messenger. What is a messenger? It's an angel. So we're dealing with an evil angel. Think angel of the bottomless pit. Think of the 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 messenger, well, what did Paul say that was a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him? Boy, you think about that one for a minute. Freemasonry, secret societies are all about this lost hidden word, this secret word, this sacred name, power words, ohm. You know what these are? They're a thorn in our flesh, people. They are a thorn in our flesh to keep us humble. God's going to empower our enemies just to keep us where we need to be. Amen? Not Om. Amen? Here he is right here. Here's Hermes, Trismegistus. He is the messenger God, which means he has a secret word. Something that is hermetically sealed means that it's been sealed so that nobody knows what's in it until such and such time. Then it's going to be unsealed. And it's named after Hermes. 
or Mercurius, the messenger angel. And Hermes carries in his hand, look at it, a rod with snakes on it. The rod, see the rod, and it's got, the rod's got wings on it. What does that tell you? It represents an angel, a spirit, something that flies through the air, all right? That's spirits. That's Hermes, that's Mercurius, that's the rod that we're, that we're looking into, that threw something with the serpents and incantations and the secret message that Mercurius has is going to cause that rod to come to life. It's known as the caduceus. And it's inside something that looks like this. Bum, bum, ba. All right? Guess who else has the rod of Hermes or Mercurius? Well, looky there. There he is again. Old Baphomet, or he, she. Baphomet is, is good, evil. He is male, female. He is the boy that puts a wig on that gets to go in the girl's bathroom. That's Baphomet. Okay? Male parts, female part, and look at his male part. It's the rod of Asclepius or the Caduceus. It's the dead stick inside the two things that are like this, like DNA, that is awaiting to come alive one of these days. How's it going to happen? Pharaoh's magicians just told us how it's going to happen. It's going to come through incantations and enchantments and power words and, and, and um, repeated prayers and mantras and ohms and praise and worship music that goes over and over and over again. This is from Kathy's, Kathy Burns' book on symbols. A book on witchcraft informs us that Mercury was the inventor of incantations and was wont to be invoked in the rites of the magicians. Are you catching that? In other words, Mercury, Hermes, the lost word, the rod with the two snakes around it, coiled up around it, that god is the one who invented witchcraft, chants, spells, incantations, power words. And the only way to get him forth and to bring him forth was by those incantations. And I'm telling you, when you are taught in your church that you're speaking those power words and those faith words and those forceful words and those negative conf or positive confessions and everything like that, and you're summoning God, let me tell you who you're really getting. You're getting a fake Jesus, a false Jesus, who needs to have the precise words spoken to him so he can understand it, so he can be invoked by your sacred words. Hail Mary, full of grace, and all that stuff. Manley Hall said several figures of Serapis that stood in his various temples in Egypt and Rome have been described by early authors. Nearly all these Gre showed Grecian rather than Egyptian influence. In some, the body of the god was encircled by the coils of a great serpent. Think about what Paul said, that no good thing that is in us. Think about it, it's that dead rod bound up inside of our, of our DNA. The power words are going to cause that thing to come in life one of these days. Just like Pharaoh's magicians use their enchantments to cause the dead stick of wood to turn into a live serpent, a beast, a dragon. Mm -mm -mm. By the way, there's verses in the Bible that tell that. Lamentations. Lamentations, I think, has a lot of things in there about the Antichrist. Listen to one of the uh, Lamentations chapter 3 specifically, and I've taught about that before, but look in Lamentations chapter 1. Look at it. The yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They are wreathed and come up upon my neck. He hath made my strength to fall. The Lord hath delivered me into their hands for whom I am not able to rise up. They are wreathed. A wreath you take, you take leafy branches and you twist them together like braid work and you make a wreath out of it. And what he's saying is, is that my transgressions are bound up in things that are twisted and coiled around it. Look at that image again of, of Hermes Trismegistus, the messenger angel. Look at it. Even in ancient Sumeria, you see the two serpents wrapped around this pole? Now watch this. Here is, here is this idea that there is something wreathed up. It's bound up inside of us, coiled up like tied up by a rope, okay, like DNA. 
Listen to the word faith preachers discuss God. Here's Andrew Womack. This is from his article, Authority Releases God's Power. He says, I know this goes contrary to popular Christian doctrine. You're right there. We're constantly told that it's not us, but God who is the healer. And I agree with that totally. But, let's see, let me stop right here. These guys always talk out of two sides of their mouth. Yes, I agree that God is the healer. But, I also believe that God has placed his healing power under our authority. And it is up to us to release it. If we don't take our authority and become commanders instead of beggars, God's power will not be released. There needs to be a radical renewing of our thinking on this issue. Yeah, radical renewing. Instead of, instead of reading your Bible and saying, Oh God, I need healing. This guy is telling you that God has the healing power, but he's put it under the command of your voice. And if you're not healed, it's because you didn't release it. You know what that is now, don't you? That's not God. That's not his powers and his ability. What they're trying to get you to release is something that is the exact opposite of Almighty God. Here's another one. Victory Church. Look at their logo. Victory Church. Here's this article. Praise releases God's power. In Psalm 22, 3, God reveals that his power in person, his glory would manifest when his people praise him. Give God an opportunity to show himself strong in your life. He is no longer between the cherubim. He lives in you. He stands ready to enthrone himself in your praise. Are you kidding me? Let me tell you what, the, you go read this article. Let me tell you what it's about. He describes how God referred to himself as the one sitting between the cherubims. That's God's throne. When I looked in Revelation chapter 4, he was still there. This guy says, God's no longer between the cherubims. He is inside of you, and he stands ready to enthrone himself in your praise. See, their doctrine is, their little witchcraft teaching is, that God is not around until you invoke him with your praise and worship service. Because, and, and they got it all turned around. Their idea is that if we praise God in the right way, using the right words with the right frame of mind, then God will release blessings to us. So let me tell you, let me tell you about what real Christians do. Real Christians worship and praise God for what he's already done. Real, they, they'll tell you, if you send us $1,000, you are sowing a seed, and God, God is waiting for you to send that money so that he can then release all of these funds to you. Really? When's the last time you gave $1,000 to me? You ever think about that? If it works that well, then why doesn't the guy on TV send me a check for $1,000? It's because he knows it's a lie. But it's the idea that if we give to God, God then must, must return that and, and unleash all this money to us. Let me tell you why God's people really give. Real God's people. They don't give expecting a return. They give because they have already got it. That's why. These people have it so turned around. They've got it backwards, people. I'm not serving God because I think it's going to get me greater things from God. I'm serving God because He's already given me the greatest thing in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ. But all these people are telling you that God's bound up and He's wreathed up and He needs to be released. Now you know what God that really is. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 10. Look at this. Look at this. Behold the day, behold it has come, the morning has gone forth, the rod hath blossomed, the rod hath budded. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. You see it now? You see those rods that Pharaoh's magicians threw down? It's the rod of wickedness. What happens? They came back to life. They budded. Fruit came out of it, just like Aaron's rod that budded. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 10, 5, check this out. The Assyrian, it's the Antichrist. Look at it. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Think of Mercury holding that caduceus with the two serpents. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. The rod, that rod's the Antichrist, people. And the magicians spoke their enchantments and brought him to life. Revelation 17, 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, 
and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Look at Proverbs 22, 14, the mouth of the strange woman is a deep pit. So what, what's coming out? What's coming out of these people? They're letting the enchantments, the power words, th think of Jesus, the real word. He's the opposite of it. That's what's coming out of them. The spirit of Antichrist himself is coming out with their enchantments. And I don't care if it's the Roman Catholic Church. I don't care if it's a Buddhist temple. I don't care if it's a new age, someone practicing yoga. I don't care if it's in the charismatic church. I don't care if it's in the, in the supposedly Bible-believing church where they say, if you pray this prayer, you'll be saved forever. Whatever it is, it's incantations. It's spells. It's enchantments. It's invoking God when God wasn't going to be invoked by any man. Now, I'm going to finish it with this. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven verses on here. Okay? And if you want to do your own study, be my guest. All I did was look up one word in the book of Psalms. If you call me and you tell me you're in distress, I'm going to tell you to go read Psalms. I'm going to tell you to read Psalms until God delivers you. Okay? Psalms are the medicine cabinet. But Psalms revealed something to me years ago that I need, I absolutely needed it. And if I, and if, because I kept thinking, God's not hearing my prayers. Maybe I'm not saying it right or whatever. I mean, I used to think that. Been there. I've been there. And I know it doesn't work. And God showed me this. It changed my life. Because I read that there's just something really, really simple that man can do that will get God's attention. And so I'm going to read you seven verses. I'm going to bid you farewell. You go to the book of Psalms. Get our software, purebiblesearch.com. Type in the word cried. Look for it in the book of Psalms. Do your own study. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even unto his ears. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. I've said that before. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, saved him out of all of his troubles. See, I learned this years ago, 20 some odd years ago. My wife and I were sitting in church. She had just had our firstborn daughter, Lindsay. Lindsay was down in the nursery. This is the first time Lisa had ever been separated from Lindsay. Lisa wanted to sit in the church service and, and we had some good people down in the nursery. And so we're sitting listening to the preaching and about halfway through, Lisa looked at me and she said, Lindsay's crying. She said, do you hear it? And I went, no, I hear the preaching. Lindsay's crying. And I was going to say, Lisa, calm down. You can't hear that. And this thing is the Holy Ghost saying, Mike, shut up. You don't know what she hears. And she said, I need to go down there. And she got up and went. And sure enough, she was down there crying. Needed mama. I learned something that day. When mama or daddy hears the cry of their children, they don't require their children to say positive things. If your child is drowning in a pool, you don't sit on the side of the pool and wait for your child to make a positive confession and say, I believe that I'm out of this water. You don't do that. You hear them choke and gasp and cry and you dive in. Anytime your children are in any kind of, and moms can know the difference between uh, I'm hurt scream and I want my toy back scream. Moms know the difference, right? Okay, moms speak scream. I cannot begin to tell you the number of times that I've just cried to the Lord and said, God, I need help. I don't even know what to ask for. And God, I don't deserve anything. But God, I need help. God was there every time. Every single time he was there. I don't have a God 
who needs me to speak the right things because I don't know what the right things are most of the time. The Bible says that too. I don't have a God who needs me to have total faith that God can do or I won't get it. I have a God who when I cry out, He's there every time. And He answers my prayer better than I prayed it every time. That's the simplicity that is in Christ. Don't let anybody tell you different. Now let me say something to maybe some people out there that you have cried to the Lord about. Let's, let's just say that there's, certain, there's a thorn in your flesh. There's sins that you just have not conquered. And you've cried to the Lord. I've, I've talked to some of you people. I know. You cried to the Lord. You meant every word of it. God, I, I want deliverance. God, I want out of this. God, I don't want to do this anymore. God heard you. He did. God speaks, cry. And maybe God didn't take away the thorn. He just put the healing balm of grace where it was. And he said, my grace will be sufficient for you. How's that? I'll leave the thorn there and just give you grace. I trust that. I trust that for my God because I know how many times I've cried to God and He didn't give me what I asked. He gave me something better. And I trust that. I don't trust me. I don't trust me at all. I don't trust my flesh. I don't trust anything about me. But I trust the grace of God. It's the only thing I count on and His Word. You see the difference now? So the next time you pray, you pray short, you pray long, do whatever you feel is right. But cry to God. When it's serious, you'll cry. God will help. I promise you, He will. It's that simple. Who are we on, you guys, that make it hard? Amen? We're going to get into familiar spirits next time. All right, so you'll be waiting for that. I hope you've learned something from this. Where all the spells and incantations and power words are going, I'm going to bring that Antichrist back up. Okay? If you, if you heard something and you said, I don't think it's right, go to the Bible. Okay? Go to the Bible. Find out the truth. All right, I got to go. See you. God bless you. I love you. Bye.